Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going ahead and start, and um, we're going to be going into closed session. We're going to discuss 2.11 expulsion referral, 2.2 certificated public employee appointment, employee, blah, 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 government code so section 54957. Classified Public Employee Appointment Employment Government Code Section 54957, 2.4 Public Employee Discipline Dismissal Release Leaves, 2.5 Existing Pending Anticipated Litigation. And that's what we're doing in closed session. Boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm say I'm supposed to talk yeah. on the mic. Sorry, then I'll I'll do this again. <laughs> we are opening our meeting for July tenth, two thousand nineteen, here this evening, and I'm going to do the pledge of allegiance, Danny. Ready, begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is Virginia here? Is that no, her? We do not have her. Okay. Bueno. Lo siento mucho, pero esta noche no vamos a tener un traductor. Um, sí, eso va a ser la primera vez. Siempre tenemos un traductor para poder ayudar a todos los que necesiten traducción. Um, este, si quieres hablar con la agenda, hay que conseguir una tarjetita a María o lo que sea. <coughs> Para poder hablar, dos minutos. If you need um, a card to speak on the agenda, um, you can get one with Eva. Oh, no, not Eva. Alicia. Alicia. She's going to get one tonight with Alicia, not Eva. <laughs> Sorry. All these, a lot of people aren't here tonight. Okay. Um, we're going to have right now the superintendent comments with Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, well, good evening. Well, the PVUSD team is excited to introduce our 2019-20 theme, All In, Every Day. So um, show up, connect, and learn. So behind us, you will see a banner promoting the campaign. PVUSD recently collaborated, collaborated with KION and Telemundo to promote the theme, and more importantly, to share with the community the services, programs, and make PVUSD a wonderful place to learn and work. So after I say it in Spanish, we will show you the commercial. So buenas noches, el equipo de PVUSD se complace en presentar nuestro tema para el año 2019-19-20 con ganas todos los días. Asiste, conéctate y aprende. Y detrás de nosotros pueden ver um, nuestra pa pancarta que está promocionando esta campaña. El distrito recientemente colaboró con KON y Telemundo para promover el tema. Y lo que es más importante es que estamos compartiendo con la comunidad todos los servicios y, el prog y los programas que hacen nuestro distrito un lugar maravilloso para aprender y trabajar. Y aquí está el comercial. <laughs> okay. At Pajaro Valley Unified School District, we're all in every day with programs that strengthen foundational literacy, the first elementary computer immersion school in the county, and flexible learning classrooms. PVUSD also recognizes the value that music and the arts brings to students with our El Sistema Music Program, Band and Choral in all secondary schools, and Latino Youth Film Institute. PVUSD, all in, every day. Mm -hmm. 
But you may be thinking, well, what does all in mean? Well, it means that for our staff and all of us that we have a relentless advocacy and service as the PVUSD family to engage in work that accepts and supports a belief, a commitment, and a passion that all students can. Uh, um, once again, at once school begins, students will have the opportunity to reflect on what all in every day means to them. Pero tal vez está pensando qué significa con ganas todos los días. Para el personal, estamos impactamente a abogar y dar servicios como una familia de distrito de participar en trabajo que acepta y apoya una creencia con permiso y pasión para todos los estudiantes que puedan. Una vez que comienza la escuela, los estudiantes van a tener la oportunidad de reflexionar sobre lo que significa para ellos de estar con ganas todos los días. So as a community, we are also coming together for common causes in powerful ways. The district has established a team to participate in this weekend's Relay for Life, the PVUSD Pirates of the Caribbean to support the fundraising event and to come together to celebrate and honor the lives of cancer survivors. Assistant Superintendent Kristen Chaus is the district's team captain. Um, Relay for Life lasts 24 hours and will begin Saturday, July 13th at 9 a.m. and end on Sunday, 10 a.m. We do need support in covering some shifts Kristen and I are walking from midnight to 3 a.m., but there are also places available for you from anywhere from 6 p.m. to 3 a.m., and if you're able to participate, um, please contact Kristen um, to sign up. So el distrito también estamos um, trabajando juntos para una causa comunes um, de nuestra poder, de, de una manera poderosa. Esta, hemos establecido un equipo para participar en el Relay for Life este fin de semana para apoyar un evento de recaudación de fondos para reunirse y celebrar la vida de los sobrevivientes de cancer. La asistente del superintendente, Kristen Chaus, que está allí, es la capitana de nuestro equipo de distrito. Relay for Life sí dura 24 horas y comienza el sábado 13 de julio a, a, la, a las 9 de la mañana y termina el domingo 14 a las 10 de la mañana. Como expliqué, nosotros dos vamos a, a caminar empezando a las 12 de la noche hasta las 3 de la madrugada, pero también necesitamos um, personas para cubrir los otros turnos empezando a 6 de la noche hasta 3 de la mañana. So, si puede participar, por favor, de um, hablar con Kristen. And have a good night. Okay. Um, now we're going to have governing board comments. So do you want to start Georgia? We're not doing too much this summer. <laughs> okay. Jennifer? Um, hi. So I was able to go to a couple of the 4th of July parades, and it was really special to really see the community coming together um, in celebration, uh, and it was that was delightful. I'm also, uh, Trustee Orozco and I met with Pastor Robin Matthew Johnson of uh, Watsonville First United Methodist Church about ways that we could potentially partner for uh, backpack drives. It's a little close for for this year, but we thought with enough planning and you know conversation that we could you know look at, at future uh, future years, um, just to ensure that our students have the supplies they need to start the school year properly. And then I just I, I wanted to I was at the Watsonville City Council meeting last night, and I wanted to extend a thank you to them. Um, they honored several of our migrant education students for their stellar work in uh, the speech and debate. Uh, competition and these students work really hard and we, we recognize that and it just meant a lot to me to see the wider community honoring these students. <coughs> Good evening, thanks everybody for being here. Um, uh, like Jennifer, I uh, marched proudly in both parades, the Aptos Parade and then we um, raced down to Watsonville um, where we walked and marched in front of the PVUSD school bus, and it was, it's always like one of the, is, wasn't it fun? Yeah. One of the best days of the year to see all the kids in the crowd and people who love PVUSD, lots of um, 
former employees waving and running out to give hugs, and um, it's just a really beautiful day, so thank you. Um, I encourage all the other board members to try it. It's really great. Um, I wanted to say one other thing. Oh, um, Aptos High School robotics team won the international competition, um, and again, um, and so we're, as a district, very, very proud to support their efforts, and um, congratulations. I'd like those kids and those families to come and give us a presentation. Yes, I, they're, they're scheduled? Okay, great, because I'd like to celebrate them as a board. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you. Good evening, everybody. Good to see everybody here during vacation time. Um, I'd just like to say thank you, PVUSD, for all the new construction that's going on. Um, I live by Watsawa High, E Hall, Mini White. Hopefully, we can get a progress update on the dirt that's at EA Hall, and hopefully, we could get some progress about some of the portables at Mini White. Um, I attended Watsawa Soccer Clinic, which was held at Ramsey. Um, some friends I went to high school with, this is their second year, they put the clinic together for free. They took about 50, 60 kids from all over the city to skim the fundamentals of soccer. Um, I just want to say thank you to my friends that put that together. Um, I also attended the city council meeting early yesterday. I couldn't make the 6.30, but I was there early. I think it's important that us, as as trustees, we already, well, we know this already, but uh, it's important that I think we attend these meetings. It, 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 we want them to know that we have a voice too. We want them to hear our voices. Um, this weekend, there's a lot of things going on this weekend. On this Friday, they're having the Lights for Liberty to end child prisons. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone's been hearing what's going on. Um, there's a, it's a nationwide event this Friday, so if you're anywhere near the Placita and um, you're against what's going on, we're locking these children up. They're having something over there. Uh, Saturday, Sunday, Relay for Life at the high school, and Miss Tristy Holm forgot to talk about her town hall that's this Sunday. I, I'm pretty sure everybody knows that lots of community hospitals for sale, and um, not everything's good, you know, so I, I encourage people to show up this Sunday at the Watsonville City Council Chambers and um, listen to what's going on. Um, this is our hospital, and it's important that we keep the jobs, we, you know, we keep the, those doors open, so thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so I was in the parade too with Jennifer and Kim and myself and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, what I do is I watch the parade. I don't want to get in the bus early. I watch the parade and then I wait till the bus passes by and then I go out there and walk and wave for the rest of the time. And then I come back to see the horses. <laughs> um, I actually... <coughs> rode my bicycle to meet with Dr. Rodriguez, and then I rode it to the Sierra Sewell to see all the sculptures there. There's probably about 60 or more sculptures. It's incredible. And there there was an adult education sculpture, and last year I went as well, and, and, and I always rode my bike. <laughs> and there was more than one adult education sculpture there that was pretty cool. Um, so I, w I went to the GPA meeting, which is a meeting we're doing in order to promote and maintain the Mellow Center. So I'm on that committee, and so and so is Danny. <laughs> and we just did it today. We just had a meeting today. And the thing that I liked about it afterwards is that I had never seen all of the student art that's in the administration building because, you know, it's been always closed when I've been able to try to go there. So I was able to walk around and see all the incredible student art that's inside the where the administration office is. And it was super fabulous. And while I was at it, I went down to the library to see the rest of the art that's, or student art that's in the library. So that was cool. Um, and tomorrow, I'm going to the Migrant Head Start. I have a committee, that's the one committee, most people don't have committees, but I do have that committee. Migrant Head Start, because obviously that's when the migrants are working. Um, and it's their beginning of their big meetings where they have at least 30 or more people from all the daycare centers and 
I'm not sure about daycare homes, or, but there's lots of people there. And they're, they're always so great to hear them because they have parent meetings where they literally have parents that are working in the fields. Up to 30 or 40 parents come to their meetings. I mean, it's amazing. Um, so that's tomorrow. Thanks. Now the approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion? Making a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Second. Second. Do I have a second? Who's the second? Okay. <laughs> oh. Oh. Um, before we take the vote, I wanted to see if we can move closed session item. 13 to before 6.1. So that one. Yeah. Yeah. Before 6.1. The readout of the yeah. of the closed session. I will look for it because I don't think that was today. I don't think so. Oh. Oh. Okay. No. Okay. So I'll amend my um, motion to include that change. Okay, th all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. So today it's one, two, three, <laughs> it's five, zero, two. Is that how it goes? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> am I saying it correctly? Five, zero, two. Okay, next is going to be the um, approval of the minutes for, your June, for June 26. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, it's five. Keep it the same. Okay, oh, it's four, zero, two. Yeah. Okay, two, zero, two. What, what is it? Four, zero, one, two. Four, zero, one, two. Okay, some of these, these are kind of things that I have a hard time saying, <laughs> these kind of <laughs> vote things. Okay, um, so we're on public comment for doing the closed session. Yeah. So we're doing. Oh, we're doing six point one before we do it. Yeah, we're doing the. Okay. The mm -hmm. We're going to do closed session now. Yeah. yeah. So all, that's all the motions. And all the okay. Um, motion number one: closed session item two point one. I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on July tenth. 2019 with 39 and six additional action items. Okay, do I have a motion? We need a second. Yeah, we have to have a second. Second. I'll, I'll make a motion, we have a second, yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion number two, closed session, item 2.2. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on July 10th, 2019 with 124 and two additional action items. Okay, I'm gonna second it. Second okay, it. I second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, here we go. All those opposed? Aye. Announcement number one. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Ivan Alcaraz as the new principal of Roland Hills Middle School. Mr. Alcaraz has been serving the, Pajaro, the students of Pajaro Valley since 2013 as an intervention counselor before becoming an assistant principal at Watsonville High School. Mr. Alcaraz is a local resident of Watsonville and a former student at PVUSD. He obtained his Bachelor's of Art in Business Management Economics at UCSC, his Master's in Education and Counseling and Student Personnel, Master's of Education in Administration and Supervision, and currently earning his Doctorate in Educational Leadership. We are proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to his new administrative role. Ivan, mean, do you want to come up and say a few words? Good evening, Madam President, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. It's kind of an honor for me to actually, you know, accept this position and, and be part again still of this district and serve the community that I that raised me and, and educated me. So it's quite an honor. I know there's great work that has been doing that's been happening at Rolling Hills, and I'm you know excited to pick up that baton and continue that work. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, 
I just want to say also congratulations, Ivan. You know, I, I before I was a, a trustee, I, I ran into you in the community, and I I know you love this community. I know you're dedicated to this community, to the students, to the parents, and congratulations, and I'll see you on the community. Thank you. Are we doing an hour? So announcement number two, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Mara Yusuzoy. Yus 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 How do you say her name? Yusefzai. Yeah. Yusefzai. As a new coordinator of English learner programs. She speaks Farsi. <laughs> Marwa has been serving students since 2007 as an elementary teacher in Giro Unified. She received her bachelor's in liberal studies, master's in education, and multiple subject teaching credential from the UC Riverside. She earned her administrative service credential from National University. Marva has currently been serving the students of Oak Grove School District as instructional coach as well as curriculum developer for the Silicon Valley Education Foundation. Marva brings a wealth of knowledge in providing professional development to teachers and administrators, developing curriculum focused on literacy and coordinated alignment of curriculum to SBAC interim assessments. We are proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to our new administrative role. Thank you. Thank you. So now, did I put 6.2? <laughs> so I'm going to put it as 6.2 now for public comments. Do we have any public comments? Do you have any? There is none. Oh, there is none. <coughs> okay, employee organization comments. Do we have a PVFT person? Uh, we do. Yes. There you go. You're here. Thank. Good to see you. <laughs> is that working? Okay. Whoa, that's a lot louder. All right. My name is Kate Friels. I'm the secretary of the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, and I'm also a teacher here. I've been teaching at Minty White Elementary for the past 10 years and recently accepted a position as a District Technology Innovation Coach. Um, I'm here tonight just to speak on behalf of the PVFT, our union. Um, I wanted to speak in regards to item 8.9, um, the Assistant Superintendent Salary Schedule Adjustment. The PVFT is in agreement that this change should never have happened in the past, and we're glad the district is acknowledging the mistake. Um, we think it's fair that Dr. Rodriguez also acknowledged that uh, a pay reduction is necessary in order to reintroduce health benefits as part of the assistant superintendent total compensation package, although the reduction should have been closer to $14,000. Um, the repeated attempts made to um, include health and welfare benefits to the total compensation package of the assistant superintendents demonstrates that Dr. Rodriguez absolutely understands the importance of health care for PVUSD employees. And that's one of the things that unionism has meant for me in my 10 years here at the district. Um, having a union to negotiate fair wages and health benefits for us, as well as good working conditions, which are good learning conditions for our students. So I hope that you all understand the importance of getting back to negotiations promptly, and we look forward to that. Thank you for your time. Okay, do I have any more of the unions here? Um, I don't think we do, to be honest with you. So, um, <laughs> um, so let's see, where, where am I? <coughs> so are, there's, not, there's not any more unions, CSBA, any of the other unions? Okay. <coughs> um, where am I? Well, I'm all mixed up here. <laughs> There we are. Okay, so 8.1, and we're going to do action items. So 8.1 is the approval of Renaissance Learning Contract by Susan Perez. Who's the Good evening, President Osmondson, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this is a contract that we, it is not a new contract. We've had Renaissance Learning for a number of years, but wanted to highlight um, this particular contract. Um, 
and share with you a little bit about how um, it is used in the district. So Renaissance Learning is a company, a software company that has a number of products. Two that we use and that are included in this um, contract, one is Accelerated Reader and the other is uh, Star Assessment. So just very briefly, our Star Assessment that we use through Renaissance Learning is a reading test. It is optional. Our teachers use it primarily as an interim assessment to monitor reading in between our MAP tests, which are given three times a year. Um, what we'd like to highlight this evening is Accelerated Reader, and I asked Claudia Monjaras, our, um, our director of ELA and History Social Science, to share with you just a little bit more about Accelerated Reader. Hi, good evening, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So um, I'm gonna quickly just go through a little bit, kind of I'm sure you've heard about AR before, but I wanna kinda do a little bit of a refresher. And um, like Susan said, it is a program that we have teachers using in the district to help students set goals around reading and um, monitor progress and be able to have conferences with students. So basically how it works is that teachers are able to have those guiding conferences with kids where they're able to run the reports. They, um, after taking the STAR test, then they can talk to kids about the reading levels, set some goals like how many books do you want to be reading, what level should those books be, um, and then the kids are able to take quizzes at their level based on books that they're reading and they can be from anywhere. They can be books from home, they can be books from the school libraries, public libraries, wherever it is that they can get their reading and even classroom books. Um, so it offers them a lot of opportunities to practice. There's actually over 200,000 quizzes available in the program so it offers them a wide range of opportunities. Um, and then the piece about the um, growth, teachers are able to monitor that and have those conversations with the kids and be able to set a, a range of different goals. Um, I wanted to kind of quickly point out that we have, um, we have about 8,742 students that are actively using the um, Accelerated Reader program and that's across our, all of our schools. We have, that's predominantly in the elementaries but we do have kids in middle school who access it and we have kids at the high school level who do access it as well. Um, and then we broke it down, um, and I'm sure you probably had an opportunity to look at this, but we did break it down um, in terms of ethnicity groups, uh, participation levels. The one up on top, if you look at um, the total number of kids participating, that 8,742, uh, over 3,000 of those kids are actually averaging at a 67%, so that means we have a range of um, comprehension uh, uh, percentage going on with the students. So, and a lot of that, I mean, we have kids that are even using it during the day and after school, so there's a wide range of that use going on. So the, the purple ones that keep, that are not, not the same, that there's ones really long and there's ones really short, those are, explain to me those, I, just, I forgot, so I looked at them. Yeah, I know, and it's kind of small on the screen there. Um, so the groups down at the bottom are the ethnicity groups. So it's a matter of how many how many kids. So I tried to put the numbers a little bit bigger on the side, the, the fraction. So, the, so like um, our largest group, the Hispanic group down there, the, there's a total of 10,636 students. But out of that 10,000, we have 6,993 6 who are actually participating using AR. Okay. So that's what those bottom fractions are, and then the top one just shows what their average comprehension percent is okay. for the students who are using the program. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, is there any questions? Yes. Uh, when you're saying the total, is that K through 12 population? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It is a much smaller percentage of students at the high school level that are using it. It's predominantly um, at our elementaries. Any other questions? Any more questions? Okay, so can I have a motion? This is an I'll make the motion. There's no speakers at all. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Five, zero, two. Five, zero, two. All right, thank you, Susan. I'm next. So oh, she's got, she's got more than just one, excuse me. 
So 8.2 is the approval of contract for the NWEA map. And this, once again, is not a new contract. This is something that we have been using um, for three years now. Um, but I wanted to just highlight a little bit the work that's going on with MAP and make sure that everybody is familiar with it. So MAP, um, which is Measures of Academic Progress, is our interim assessment that we use three times a year. It's provided by the Northwest Evaluation Association. And I think the one piece I'd like to highlight on this slide are the number of students nationwide who are using this assessment, and I'm going to come back to that a little later on. Um, but MAP basically is given three times a year. We use it for language arts and math, we are in, excuse me, reading language arts and math. The language arts is optional for um, schools, but we do have a number. Primarily, we focus on reading and math. Um, we are using it in second grade through high school. Um, What's really nice about MAP is that it monitors progress over time and provides teachers with information about what students are ready to learn next so that they can use it as a uh, strong instructional tool. MAP is aligned to California standards and it is entirely computer scored um, and it is a computer adaptive assessment, which means that it is unique. Every single student, if you're sitting in a room with 25 students, every student is going to be having a little bit different assessment, even though they're all taking MAP. And if the assessment, if students answer a question right, the next question is going to be harder. If they answer a question wrong, the next question is going to be easier. And what it's going to provide teachers then is accurate information about what each student is ready to learn next regardless of whether the student is several years below grade level or actually advanced and beyond grade level, which is one of the things that is really powerful with this tool. Um, it uses a RIT score, um, which is just an acronym from Roush Unit, and it is something like a yardstick. And I, I'm hoping I can show you how this works um, with an example I have on the next couple of slides. So one of the things that is really great about this tool is that it measures progress over time. It does not matter grade or um, age. It, it, is, it has nothing to do with grade or age. It's really measuring a student's growth from um, beginning of literacy and numeracy through adult letters, levels of literacy and numeracy. So here's my comparison. If you think about a child, and I'm sure we've all done this with our own kids or had this as kids, you stand up against the wall, you get your height marked, and regardless of your age, your height is monitored over time. Well, you can um, think of the RIT sort of as a growth chart but around learning, where you're getting those incremental measures over time. And just like a pediatrician uses that height chart, um, uses norm measures to tell parents how their students' growth compares with other students um, their same age, teachers can use uh, grade level norms to help be able to tell how their students compare with other students nationwide, and that's why those that large number of students I pointed out earlier is so important. So the way we use MAP in this little diagram is a little bit hard to read, but you can see at the beginning of the year MAP is given, Teachers get a lot of information from that. Then there is several months where instruction is happening, assessments are being given in the classroom, and then another map is assessment is given mid-year. Same information is gathered. What's powerful about that mid-year is that it gives good information so that teachers can make mid-course corrections prior to the state tests in the spring. Similar pattern instruction and classroom assessment, and at the end of the year, there is a third MAP assessment, which provides information that can help um, determine placement and um, good information for the following school year, because we don't get state tests back until August. And I'm happy to take any questions. Less a question than a comment, and uh, I'm familiar with adaptive testing uh, through my work as a nursing instructor. And I, w I hadn't known 
that map testing is the adaptive uh, quizzing model, and, and I, was, I was just very pleased, because I know that for, as an instructor, I use that as a formative assessment for guiding my own students' mm -hmm. work. So I, I just wanted to express that I was pleased to see that. Great, thank you. Um, so I was hoping that, um, you know, with those uh, map assessments, and we've talked about it before, that each student is, you know, this you can work with each student and talk about their growth with them and you know they can feel good about where they've grown or they can actually say to them to my to themselves or to whomever to the teacher or whomever that I'm going to I'm going to read more books from this time to the next time I'm going to read this many more books or I'm going to um, in the math part I'm going to figure out how to do the multiplication you know I'm going to work on whatever but you know in other words to the students can feel good about what they've done well and they can figure out what they need to do to do better so it's really important f you know that every teacher is working with each and every student so that they know exactly what they've done well and what they need to do better so they can feel good about it and they can feel they can tell themselves I'm going to do better I'm going to do this or that whatever so it's it's one that I hope that every single student is is worked with <laughs> is that happening yeah when I go into classrooms um, I very often have teachers who will ask their students to show me their um, their goals for map um, and there I think more and more as we continue to use this um, it has gone from teachers looking at the assessment results to sharing with students and now students being more and more involved in their own goal setting and understanding um, what the reports are sharing about their growth. Yeah, that's, that's for me is really important to happen. <laughs> I really would like that to happen. All right. Any other comments? Um, so for the kids that um, are falling behind or maybe not doing as well as we'd hoped on MAP, um, when do interventions begin? Interventions um, are ongoing throughout the school year, um, but certainly at the beginning of the year after the first MAP assessment, um, schools are taking a look at that, those MAP scores in the fall. We use them for a number of different things, but um, absolutely determining whether interventions are appropriate or more interventions are needed is something that takes place after that initial MAP in the fall. And then I know that um, schools also use the spring MAP scores to determine whether students need to start out um, getting additional support in the fall. And by additional support, can you just articulate what that looks that like? That varies Is it at leveling each school. Um, for some parts of the, um, their academic day, it can include some leveling, not um, a lot. I think that um, at the elementary level, it, the, the tests are reading and math, so the reading scores can show certain aspects of reading that need support, and so for a portion of the reading block, students may receive intervention that's specific to what their MAP um, scores are indicating they need support for. But our interventions look, a, look different at each school, depending upon the needs at that school site. Can you articulate and just name a few of the interventions? Um, in some cases. If they're, if they're different at every school, I'm not sure how, we're measure, how are we measuring each school well, the MAP scores help measure that, but there right. are other um, tools that schools are using. If, if we're talking about the early grades, um, we have different assessments for reading in the primary grades. In the upper grades, there are also the, um, in addition to these periodic benchmarks, we also have um, curriculum embedded assessments, and then for reading, the STAR assessment that I just mentioned that teachers can use in between those MAP scores to monitor reading as well um, is used. So Susan, but this is like a, the land that you live in, so I know you know what you're talking about, but I'm trying to get it like granular so that a lay person can understand. So the people that are watching this on TV, what are the interventions we're using if kids are not achieving well on the MAP score? Can anybody speak to you that? Start? I can add to Sure, it. so I think since my arrival, we have done a combination of digital embedded uh, interventions and um, teacher-based interventions. So 
for example, in the area of mathematics, um, we have three different types of intervention programs that we have in place. So we have ST Math, which is a digital math program. We have Alex, which is part of our math labs. Um, we and we have um, and that's digital too. Those are digital yeah. too. Yeah. Then we have non-digital, like Elevate Math, which is actually occurring as we speak. Mm -hmm which is an intervention for students who are not achieving at the appropriate levels in the area of mathematics. And we have similar things for in literacy. In literacy, for the elementary level, we have Lexia, which is a computer-based assessment. Um, and then we have um, $3 million worth of intervention teachers in our school sites. So what happens generally, and we're working through SIPs, so through SIPs, one thing that we've done is we try to ensure that what we're doing in intervention is more tightly aligned with research and also with best practice. So now at the K-3 level, our intervention teachers are doing what we call a double dose, which means that they're doing a second layer of um, SIPS instruction. It's not the same instruction. There's actually a second set of lessons that the kids are doing. So if they're not making enough growth, then they are, um, during the time in which the kids are leveled, then they are taken out and they are given that double dose. Um, so those are some specific examples um, that we're doing um, for intervention for kids. Thank you, and I didn't mean any <laughs> disrespect, uh, but I know it's like the place that you're in and you think about mm -hmm. all the time, but I think for people who don't know what that actually looks like, that's what I was trying to get at. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's put this on. <laughs> okay, so this is an action item, so I need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. I'll second. Okay. Um, all those in, there's not in, no. like the speakers, obviously. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's 502. Okay. Um, now the next one is in action. Item two, 8.3, approval of AP statistics adoption recommendation. These are like textbooks yes. and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yes. And we don't typically bring AP um, books forward as adoptions, but we have had a, a huge focus on mathematics. And one of the reasons that we don't typically do a full adoption for AP courses is that um, we don't necessarily have the same AP courses at all high schools, so it isn't unusual to have a singleton teacher um, who is teaching an AP physics or an AP chem, something like that. But AP statistics we do have at our schools. We had been concerned that we had um, very different curriculum at each of the high schools for AP statistics, and as we were really trying to clean up mathematics, we wanted to address this one. So um, this winter, Araceli Mendez pulled in um, the three schools and began to recruit pilot teachers. Um, in February, they began to really do the review process through February, March. In March, they found out that the AP test for um, statistics was going to change for next year. Yeah, so um, they had originally reviewed four books. Um, these were the four that they really spent some time reviewing. They used um, as we do our, for all of our adoptions, a rubric and specific criteria that is, um, comes through guidance from the state. But then based on really taking a look at the changes that were coming with the AP statistics exam in the fall, they did determine that this particular book, The pra Practice of Statistics, was the most closely aligned to the new test that was coming out and would be the most appropriate textbook for our AP statistics courses. And this is the one that they are recommending. And so I'm just here to bring that forward on their behalf and hopefully have you approve that recommendation. Okay. Not any speakers, obviously. <laughs> Okay, it sounds like well they pick the book, we have to pick it with them. <laughs> That's what they think we pick the book with them. Okay, do I have a motion for the selection? I'll move. A second. 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Five zero two. I do have a um, request though to the agenda committee. I would like to see a report on um, our AP success or non-success. How many kids took AP classes? How many kids actually took the test? And what the pass rates were at each school? Thank you. Mm. Okay, um, 8.4, Luis <laughs> Medina, approval of migrant education 2019-20 CDE application and funding. And I know you've had this before. This is, I mean, this is ongoing, correct? Uh, yes, but this is the first time that I actually present this item. Oh. I, I've been, never been asked to actually do oh. this. Oh, so. wow. Yeah. Okie dokie. But you've been getting it before. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> well, good afternoon, uh, President Karen Osmondson, uh, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, my name is Luis Medina, I'm the Director of Migrant Education. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to provide a short overview of how Migrant Education Regional Living application is approved at the state level and for this body to approve our 2019-2020 budget of $3,493,474. Um, I do have a, a disclosure to make in terms of the uh, budget uh, since the allocation of the budget, the state has added uh, an additional $258,000 to our budget, which is not on not part of that, so that's why I just didn't include it in there, but just to let you know that it's an addition to our funding. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. uh, in short, uh, usually in March of every year, CDE Migrant Education informs the 20 migrant, uh, migrant regional um, at the state level uh, they give us our preliminary funding allocation for the next fiscal year. Uh, the allocation is based on uh, numbers from the uh, previous uh, uh, year. Uh, once we receive the uh, preliminary funding allocation, CDE opens the online application. We are given about a month to complete the process. But before we start, uh, I meet with the uh, PAC, uh, migrant PAC, to let them know about the allocations. Uh, if any changes need to be made to the application and if they want to add anything to the application. Uh, also, if there's going to be any changes to our personnel, we do inform HR that the other, there might be some changes to personnel. Uh, the, applic the application is a number of categories that we must follow based on the uh, guidelines that are outlined on the uh, CD Migrant State Service Delivery Plan. These are nine categories that we must follow. Uh, those are English Language Arts, Mathematics, ELD, High School Graduation, Dropout Prevention, School Readiness, Out of School Youth, health, uh, parent and family engagement, and student engagement. If the, uh, it is the uh, CDE's uh, migrant education uh, uh, department's recommendation to hire highly qualified certificated personnel to provide supplemental service to migrant children during the after school and summer school programs. For every program that we offer, we must provide a detailed description of the program and a very detailed budget breakdown on how the funds will be used. We're also under strict regulations by Migrant CDE Fiscal Department that we must not use more than 15% of our allocation for administrative costs. The goal is to use the funds for highly qualified supplemental services to our migrant students and their families. Some samples of the programs that we offer, we have a pre-K program that is home-based and site-based uh, and a Friday swimming class for the parents and the child. We have an ROB program and the uh, robotics uh, that most middle schools uh, participate. We have a voice and growth and engineering for all middle schools. We have MAKE, which is a migrant academic of knowledge and engineering. And those are Saturday academies for all uh, middle schools uh, students. Uh, uh, migrant after school, which is broken into three different components. We have a K-1 uh, component. Uh, we have a second and fifth uh, math and science and a second and fifth picture writing component. Cyber High uh, for high school students, and we offer that a, a, at all uh, high school levels, uh, including Renaissance and um, New School. We have speech and debate uh, for middle school and high school, among other programs that, that you have on your, on your forms. 
Um, we also offer a uh, few residential programs and long-term high school programs during the summer, and those are Cal Poly Epic STEM program, which is a one week, and students are, uh, will be going next week. Uh, we have a, a CSU uh, Channel Island Leadership program that is a two week uh, residential program. We have Close Up for New Americans, which is one week for high school and five days for middle school. We have Cabrillo uh, English, class, uh, English class that is a six week program and they're going right now. Uh, we also continue to cooperate with the uh, with P PBUSD Adult Education, Salud para la Gente, Cabrillo Community College, uh, State and Federal Department uh, uh, for assistance on our uh, parent component, uh, Jim Booth, a uh, swim school, uh, writer affiliated company, Pajaro Library, and Mid Penn Housing. Um, Again, to, in conclusion, once we submit the application, uh, our consultant at the state level gives us feedback on our application and our programs. And if there are any uh, questions that they might have, uh, we keep going back and forth uh, until the application is complete. Um, once the application is complete, they do email us a, uh, an approval letter, and that's the letter that you have in front of you. Um, I do wanna say that the, uh, um, we, need to be, uh, we submit reports to the state every uh, quarter uh, we do meet with, with our accountant, uh, uh, my accountant, a PBUSD accountant, uh, constantly just to make sure that we're spending our funds uh, uh, based on the uh, on the application. And that's it. Any questions? Well, so all these week and two weeks programs are all during the summertime. I. Uh, Yes, only one is during, uh, actually the uh, Boys and Girls in Engineering is not a, a residential program, but it's a Cabrillo and it's a week, uh, one week. And the uh, girls component happens during the winter and the boys during the summer. The, the, and what is the girls? In the girls and Engineering is a, it's oh. a, it's a collaboration between PUSD, Migrant, and, and Cabrillo. Uh, this is a program that they've been having for years at the uh, main campus at Aptos Cabrillo Center. And it's a program that the uh, middle school students, usually it's only for girls, and it's the uh, program that the uh, parents have to pay uh, to be part. Uh, they came to us uh, saying that there was a need in Watsonville for a program such as that. The, uh, they talked to us, so we decided that it was a great uh, component uh, or addition to our program. We spoke to the state, they agreed that it would be okay to spend the funds. Uh, so, um, and we talked about having a boys component, they agreed. So we actually uh, created, instead of just having a boys, we have a boys and girls uh, separate. And every program is one week long. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. And is there any other questions about all the stuff you were saying? <laughs> and a lot of programs <laughs> that you're doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so when they were recognized for the speech and debate at the city council, it was because the students had were awarded something someplace for doing it. The uh, uh, yes, the um, well, the uh, three of our students actually um, actually won a couple of competitions uh, on the speech uh, component. Um, the um, there were one kid from Yeho actually won, uh, I believe was a f uh, second place, no first and third place. Uh, in, in, in speech, there was one student that actually, uh, Parra, who's a senior at Watson Bo High, he's, uh, and they mentioned that the, uh, he's been here for a couple of years. He was supposed to give the uh, speech in Spanish, um, but the, um, there wasn't anybody that was gonna give it in English, so the, um, even though he's been here for two years, he's uh, went through um, all the levels of ELD. He's uh, taking AP classes at Watson Bo High, Oh uh, and wow. he gave the speech in English, and he took second place. And, um, and there's one student from Pajaro uh, High School uh, who gave the uh, speech in Spanish. She earned first place. The, uh, um, last year, she was part of the um, debate uh, team, and I was able to see her uh, performance at that level, and she was amazing, and that team took first place from Rolling Hills Middle School, and that was last year. Wow. That's mm -hmm. pretty. A and it's been a transition the last three years. The, um, we started, the, the competition has been happening for more than 10 years at the state level. Uh, PBUSD never competed. Uh, three years ago, we decided that we were gonna be taking a team. We took a team of eight. Uh, it was just, we just pulled kids uh, that wanted to participate. There was no training, uh, there was no setup. 
in the following year, the, uh, we took 32 uh, kids. The, um, there was minimum training. It, we were just going through transitional uh, process. This year, we actually were able to um, hire Ramiro Medrano, who decided he actually was a, a judge at him. the uh, state level, and the, uh, he know. took it over. Really and I'm sure the next year we'll be bringing a lot more trophies than just three. Wow. So we're we're building win. the team. Yes. Super great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, no. yet it is an action item. So, sounds great what he was saying, and I'm glad we asked, I asked him questions <laughs> too. So, do I have a motion? To make the motion to approve this agenda item. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Five, zero, two. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, now this is the exciting part because we're going to see some. Don't We're going to see some videos. So this is the agreement between Pajaro Valley School District and Latino Film Institute Youth Cinema Project. And it's by Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah. So I will be short in, um, in the response so that you can actually see some of our students' work in action. So two years ago, we started this collaboration with the Latino Youth Film Institute. Um, because of the high level of um, scores of increases that we've seen at the two school sites in which we're implementing it, so at Starlight Elementary and Cesar Chavez Middle School, we actually had PACE, which stands for the um, Policy Analyst for Public Education, is now currently doing an audit of our program, and so we should receive that in a couple of months so that we will have an outside source validating um, the good work that we're doing. Um, we do do an Oscars each night. This is the Oscars from the other um, year, so we had it again um, this past year, and I wanted to show you a version of what our students do. So the reason why this is so impactful is oftentimes um, writing becomes a laborious task that feels not authentic or um, has a real reason for why they're doing it. A lot of times they feel that it's, it's the teachers asking me to do it and I'm doing it just solely as an, an assignment. In this case, what it is is the kids get into teams, they all have to write scripts, then they have to pitch their, their, their scripts. Then through the student group, not the teacher, but the student group, all the students choose one of the scripts. Those scripts are then together edited and amplified, and then they get to this point. And so you'll see at the end of the credits all the different jobs that the kids have. Um, I chose this one specifically because the last video that I showed you where um, you, you saw the um, you know cameras ready, action, cut, this is actually the result of that the short clip, this is the video, and here you go. It's little scary cat Max. What? What? What do you guys want? We just want to say hi. Should you be out here? Get back to class before I pull out my detention slip. I need a meal. So you guys both want to change up the school programs? Yes, we're both really interested in learning more about science. Okay, okay. I'll give you guys both a week to try it out. Yes.
Nothing happened. Are you sure? It's just it. These kids are being mean to me. Oh, I'm sorry, son. You're a very smart kid. You should try talking to them. Okay, Dad. Are you dumb or something? <laughs> <laughs> How was school today? It, it, it was it was pretty bad. What do you mean it's pretty bad? I just don't want to talk t talk about it, okay? Okay, okay, fine. We don't need to talk about it, but I'm here for you. Today, uh I'm doing a presentation about endangered uh, 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 animals. Save the, the sea tur turtles because they, they are going ex extinct. Please help. Anything can Max, is this a joke? <laughs> Max, that's so inappropriate. Max ran away yesterday. He's been having some hard days at school. We need your help to find him. Any information can help. This is not good. We've been looking for hours. Maybe we could look more tomorrow. No, we need to find him today. It's all our fault. Fine, let's look more. Thank God we found you. Well, what's wrong with you, Max? What do you guys want? We're just trying to help you. I'm tired of you guys being mean to me. And you know what? I don't care if I stutter. This is who I am. And you guys are going to have to deal with it. We will, but just please come back. So anyway, that's one example of one of the videos that the group of students did. Um, what you'll notice in this is this is um, a two-year contract. What that allows us... Huh? I have a loud voice. So what it allows us to do is to lock in the price so that it doesn't um, continue to increase. Um, and we will, we are expanding the program to eighth grade next year. So it started at sixth grade, went to seventh grade, started at fourth grade, went to fifth grade. So now it's at fourth and fifth at Starlight. It's not increasing at Starlight. It started at six at, at um, Cesar Chavez, went to seventh, and now it's going to eighth grade. So it would be at sixth, seventh, and eighth. Um, and then the following year, um, we will take it to ninth grade, and it will actually wind up being um, in ninth grade English um, film writing class elective or course. So instead of ninth grade English, they would be able to take um, a film writing class. Um, we are having, um, our students will be on the red carpet at the Hollywood um, Chinese Theater on Wednesday, um, July 31st, and um, this film um, will be seen by actual actors and people in the industry um, and several of our other films as well, um, and our students will be there and honored and on a panel discussion as well. So I hope that you, um, that you approve the action item.
Thank you. Um, Michelle, you said that in a couple months there will be an audit on it, a third party independent audit, correct? So um, after that's done and you have that information, can you just bring that forward in a report item on our next agenda? And um, I'm excited to see it do so well. I was very supportive with you about this. I know you it was implemented in the previous district you're at, and we were at CSBA together when we saw it, a performance of students throughout the state. Um, so I'm glad that it's doing so well. And um, if none of my colleagues have any other questions, I'll make a motion to approve it. It's a beautiful opportunity for the kids in the district to be able to participate in something that's special. I saw so many values and really their strong voice, I think, permeated through that video. So I think it's, it's a beautiful way to learn. So yeah, I'm in full support and I'll second George's um, motion. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Approve 8.6 provisional internship permits, and that's in, in order to be fully staffed at special education, for one thing. Uh, thank you, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, t that was an awesome video to follow, so I'm gonna need a little bit of help pre uh, presenting this item, so I'm gonna call on somebody very tall, um, Allison, to help me. <laughs> um, so this item is, um, we continue to have a significant shortage of teachers nationwide, although our district team aggressively uh, engages in a myriad of recruitment strategies, um, the shortages of appropriately credentialed teachers still exist. Um, and similar to other districts, we are submitting for review and approval by our governing board of trustees applications for provisional intern permits to meet our teacher needs. And these meets the legal requirements delineated and the Every Student Succeeds Acts, which replace the No Child Left Behind legislation. Um, which to comply with the requirements from the county office and the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, uh, school districts must present a notice to the governing board in a public meeting with a signed statement from the superintendent or uh, her designee and a verification that the item was acted favorably upon. Um, our HR director, this tall person behind me, um, Allison <laughs> Iazawa, and our HR team have been really aggressively recruiting, advertising, searching far and wide to find the best educators for our students. And Allison will do the honors of providing a background of the five candidates, some of whom came out of state um, to join our PVUSD family. <laughs> um, yes, so we have five for you tonight. So Luisa Arias, also a former student of mine at PVHS, throw that out there, um, is a graduate of UCSC and she will be, and she's being recommended as a mild moderate um, special education teacher at PV High. Um, we have Rosie DeMoya, she's a um, graduate of Illinois State University, so that was what uh, Dr. Queen was talking about, and she is rec being recommended as a mild moderate teacher for Watsonville High. Um, Christian Flores is um, a graduate of San Jose State University and she is being recommended um, for a PE teacher at Aptos High. Then we have Betsy Gladish um, out of San Francisco State University and um, she is being recommended for a mild moderate position at McQuitty Elementary. And then we have Elizabeth Jensen out of Georgia Mason University um, in Virginia. I'm just looking that up. And uh, she's a mild, she's being recommended as a mild moderate teacher at PV High. So those are the five we have for you tonight. So it, it does mean that we are pretty much fully staffed, even though obviously they're not quite credential, but a, in special education, we haven't. 2.5 positions. Yeah. yeah. District class, class, classroom yeah. positions we classroom haven't filled yet. As of yeah. Today. Which is, uh, I think, at this time, um, probably the best that we would yep. have. And we have okay. interviews tomorrow. Are you talking about in total or? Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, really? District-wide. Wow, for Selfa. That's, what I'm that's great. For Selfa, not the Oh, for Selfa only. But that's still still that's, that's very, very yes. Yes. yeah. For Selfa, okay. we that's a hard one to yeah. get them in. Yeah. 
a really hard one. Good job. Can I, can I ask a question? No, you can ask Do we have any speakers? <laughs> no, we don't have any speakers yes, at all. Um, so these are interns, so they're not yet credentialed, correct? They're, they're getting a, a PIP, so it's a waiver. It's not even an intern. It's a waiver before being coming an intern. So it's an emergency waiver, for lack of better words. Yeah, it's an emergency credential. Right? Yeah, correct. So are they, in, are they entered into a credential program, these people? That or? is what the goal is. So they get on an emergency permit, basically a PIP or a STIP for a year, and um, while they're getting their prelims ready to get in into an intern program. Because okay. a lot of times there's classes and other prereqs that they need to take in order to be eligible to get into an intern program. So my guess is that they need extra support mm -hmm. um, because these are challenging positions that we're mm -hmm. asking them to do. So mm -hmm. can you explain a tiny bit what what that will look like so that we can support them to do a good job I know. I got so and serve our kids well. Do we have to put the microphone back in? No. no. I, I got it? Okay, let's keep it up here. Um, yeah, so we, we <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just giving her a hard time. We, um, well, you all approved a mentor program with and that we did in conjunction with PVFT to offer stipends to our current teachers, veteran teachers that we give to support our STIPs and PIPs because they're not a preliminary credential. Um, they don't go through NTP, New Teacher Project, sorry acronyms I know they don't go through the new teacher project so we have um, mentor stipends that were given to our veteran teachers to support them um, as well and we're also working with new teacher project with SELPA to have them train some of our TOSAs to support the special ed because they need a little bit just with all the IEPs and the meetings and everything they're needing just a little bit more support than a than a typical um, classroom teacher so we're working yeah, on that yeah. as well yeah yeah okay <coughs> Yeah, go ahead. So it, it seems like, would it be best to sort of like categorize this as more as like a fellowship? I mean, they're not work out working on their own with students. They're working. Oh, they are. They are. Mm -hmm. So it's not a fellowship partnership under an experienced teacher nope. in that program. Mm -mm. Okay. And, and the idea is to that hopefully all these teachers will become credentialed teachers and here. They're not going to go anywhere. They're going to stay here. They're going to work gonna with us. We're going to chain them to the desk. No, yeah, they're going to work, yeah. work yes. with us. They're going to really like to work with us. We're going to be really making them feel good about what they're doing and give them you know, all the assistance they need to be able to do, continue to do a great job, and then they're going to stay here. <laughs> yeah, of the ones we had for this current school year, we had – I can't remember off the top of my head, but about 40, we had about 60 total, and not necessarily all pips and sips, but of that, 40 of them became interns within the year and then moving into their preliminary. So they're definitely staying in the district and they're definitely moving forward with their education to get themselves into a preliminary, which then puts them in the pipeline with NTP and staying in the district. Sounds good. I'm sorry, George, just something came. So, Chona, is this, um, how long do, these people stay typically in this position. Is it like one school year, two school years? Yeah, for the provisional intern permit, they can only do one year, okay. and they have to get into an intern uh, program. And then once they complete that program, they will go through NTP, which is the to clear their credential. Okay. All right. Thank you. One more question. You said so. Last year, you said it was sixty. And we retained 40 out of 60? No, no, we retained almost all of them. I'm just saying in terms of that group of PIPs, STIPs, yeah. and interns, oh, the, they moved, whole. the whole group, yeah. So we that was about our total. Mm -hmm. And throughout the year, we got over half of them were moved into like interns, which then I don't have the exact numbers in front of me right now how many are prelims, but yeah, they're, they're moving through the process. So is this number of only five? How did you derive at that number, Chona, of needing the – just five, or did you need more and five was all you could get? Uh, it's the latter, yes. Okay. Right. So you. we're continuing to aggressively recruit to fill the positions. And you could do that throughout the school year? It doesn't have yes. to be like they have to be hired before the yes. school year begins? Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask for a motion. I'll move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> Aye. All those opposed, five, zero, two. Okay, we're now gonna have a, um, this one's pretty exciting, actually. 
8.7 new class description for alternative media specialist. And I just want to say something, you can say it too, but she actually creates books, worksheets, and everything in Braille, which is pretty amazing, pretty incredible, well, pretty exciting too, that she does all that. Yes. She definitely needs a new classification. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so thank you, uh, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, to present this uh, item with me is somebody a little bit closer to my height, my other director, uh, Pam Shanks. Um, we had a classified employee that submitted a reclassification request, uh, which resulted in the, the development of a new class description, the alternative media specialist. And the classified employee submitted the request in a timely manner and provided information showing that there was a gradual increase or accretion of her duties over time, thus necessitating a, a, the change. Um, HR Director Pam will share the essential information regarding the new class description and the salary. Well, she just said everything I was going to say. But <laughs> 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 um, we did have some an opportunity to spend some time with this employee, and it is really incredible some of the work that uh, she does for our district. Um, as uh, President Osmondson said, she creates books um, with uh, books. Braille, and she does um, these um, kits that are sent, um, where there's different sensory, um, um, where there's smells and um, touches and different um, things in the packet that um, provide things to students so that they can learn um, in different ways. Um, she creates these books that have large print. So there's just, there's a lot of variety of different things that she does and it was really incredible to watch um, what she does. And so yeah. I am um, presenting this job description this evening so that we can get it approved by the board. Um, the commission did uh, see the reclassification request and the new description last month at their meeting and it did um, get approved by them. So I'm just bringing it forward for the board to approve it this evening. And, and of course, she, and hopefully she's getting a much higher raise. <laughs> the the salary uh, range recommendation that was approved by the commission is commensurate with um, this kind of position out in the market. So what was she? What, what range was she getting before, and what is she getting now? Um, I think she, before she was about a range thirty eight, and this is a range forty two. So it's about a three, four range um, increase over what she was making before. Okay, do I, any more comments? No, no. Okay, okay. or questions, no, questions or comments. How many children in the district do we have that have low vision or vision impairment? I don't know. It's, it's a low income on that. I think that, um, if I recall when we met with her, sh I wanna say there was maybe 40, 45 students that she works with? It's it, it's one of our low incidence disabilities, so it is not um, you know, a large number of students within our district. We have two teachers, and then we have this new position with this person that helps support with making the braille for the students. They have about 20 students on their caseload each, so it is around 40. Okay. So, so, but I don't have the exact number. This is just a dumb question, but do we really need somebody on staff to make braille stuff, we have yeah. Yes. So that's what I want to hear. Like, yeah. tell me why, because okay, it seems like it's something that can be easily contracted out. It's very expensive to contract okay. it out, and we yeah, have students expensive. that are visually impaired that are taking regular general education classes, and they need all of their books, trans, you know, put into braille. So this person is able to do that and do it in house, and that is quicker at times if they can get the material and turn it around and get it back to the students. So they're working with teachers and knowing that, okay, we're doing this unit next, I have to prepare this and get it ready, and um, so they can access general education classes. Okay, it's so it's something we have to have. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, and I'm, s uh, and I'm very impressed with her. <laughs> I'll make um, a motion to approve this position. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Five, zero, two. And this is now another 8.8 .8 revised job description with Dr. Chona Killeen again. Um, and this is the position that's going to become non-management. So we're actually gonna be saving some money with this position. Correct. 
Thank you, um, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, the school districts in Santa Cruz County transitioned their financial and business management systems from digital schools to escape um, on and starting on July 1, 2019. And this transition has required and will continue to require significant support to be provided to the school sites and departments to ensure a smooth transition. This was um, previously a vacated position, was a management position as President Osmondson had mentioned. And as part of the restructuring for our business department, um, this position will now be a classified non-management position. And the revised class description reflects these changes. I'm gonna go ahead and let um, Ms. Shanks go ahead and share the, the, the changes in the, the job description. There was a lot of changes, actually, she gave it to us. Uh -huh. um, so primarily the changes are that the position is non-management now, so the um, parts about uh, supervising employees has been removed. Um, and um, this position will um, assist with our implementation of our escape database um, and providing a lot of end user support and training. Um, and that's really where this position is gonna be focused. Um, there's a, it's a pretty big learning curve for quite a number of staff throughout the district to learn our new system. So having that person that they can go to um, with support in learning our new system is gonna be very critical and important. Um, the other piece um, on minimum qualifications is typically our management positions. We would require a bachelor's degree and some years of experience. And um, in our non-management bargaining unit positions, we typically don't require a bachelor's degree um, so that the minimum qualifications have been changed um, slightly to um, require high school diploma and more years of experience. So we have somebody with that actual like hands-on experience um, and that's typically what we hire with our classified positions. And other than that, the, those are the, um, the major changes that have been made. Oh, and then um, the salary is being recommended um, at a range 57, which is also commensurate with that um, uh, scope of work that is done by this kind of position. And then also the um, position will be uh, brought to the personnel commission at their meeting next week for approval as well. Okay. Um, do I have a motion? <laughs> I'm making a motion. <laughs> All second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Five zero two. Okay. okay. The last one is the approval of the revised salary schedule, and in this case, benefits <laughs> for our assistant superintendent contracts. Yes. Thank you very much. So, as mentioned Dr. earlier Dr. tonight, yeah. that. What the intention of this action item is to currently there are no other um, certificated or classified employees, full-time employees in the entire district that do not receive health benefits other than our assistant superintendents. So in 2006, there was a decision at that time to remove the health benefits for them to forgo their health benefits and to add ten thousand eight hundred and forty dollars onto their salary schedule this is um, taking off that ten thousand eight hundred and forty dollars so the attachments that you see one is the proof that it actually is in fact the ten thousand eight hundred and forty dollars and the other is the new salary schedule so you see in when you it's in an excel when you click at the bottom you will be able to see the 1819 shows the higher salary. When you click at the 1920 proposed, you'll see that that $10,840 has been removed from each cell um, on there. What the approval of this item is, is the approval of the five different contracts. And you'll note in the narrative that except for Susan Perez, all of them have only two changes. One is their change in salary, which is aligned to the new salary schedule. And then two, um, that they now receive benefits um, because in their previous contract, it stated specifically that they did not. Um, all other terms have stayed the same, so they have not been extended. Nothing else, no other terms have changed. 
Um, for Susan, there was a slight change because she is retiring. Um, and so because of that, her end date did change and it changed to the last date um, that she is going to be with us, which is August 13th. Um, so she had three slight changes on hers because we're going to be celebrating her retirement soon. Um, and so um, we do have the support of um, the two union groups and so we are happy that um, we are able to provide um, this benefit to all of our employees here at PBUSD. Okay, no speakers of course. So can I get a motion? I, I have a question before. Okay. Um, I remember seeing there's different levels and I noticed a lot of assistant superintendents are on level seven. How did they get from one to seven? So most of them were at seven prior to their, uh, prior to this change. So when you look at their previous contract, they were already at level seven. Um, and there was two, there are two employees that were not at level seven that did go up one level because it was after July 1st. And so they have step and column. I do, I personally do not have step and column, but our cabinet does in let, if they, unless they're at step seven. And so two, two of our members did go up in step and column, meaning because it was after July 1st. Um, I have another question. Why is Chona's contract not on here? So Chona was originally brought in with benefits. So that is why the salary schedule is different uh -huh. because she was with, um, she was brought in with benefits. Originally, there was the desire of the board at that time, um, and my desire as well, to provide benefits to all employees. When she was brought in, um, it was flown with benefits. And so because of that, she continues to receive benefits. All right, I, I have a question for Chona, if, you, if she can answer questions. Mm -hmm. On May 14th, on social media, the Merced City School District, it was shown that you accepted the position and you were to start July 1st. Can you tell us what happened and why you decided to rescind that? Um, when I had applied to Merced, there was a family issue that um, we needed to take care of. And um, when I came to this district a couple of years ago, um, you know, I, I chose to come to this district because I love working with the student population and I didn't want to leave the district. Um, and it was a very difficult decision. And so I went from and the, the, the salary um, over um, in the other school district was enticing, but I was able to take care of the family situation that I had, and I was not ready to leave our district um, because there's a lot of work to do. I truly believe in Dr. Rodriguez's vision for the district and all the hard work, and I, I wanna be part of the team that continues to move forward with that and move forward with the students. And, um, you know, and, and there are board members um, that were here when I first arrived and, um, you know, very supportive, you know, ask good questions and, you know, wanting to move forward with the kids and who doesn't want to be um, uh, staying here. And with regard to Merced, um, they were not happy with me. Um, I did rescind my acceptance because um, this is my priority and since I was able to take care of the family situation, I got the best of wor both worlds, which is taking care of my family and staying in a district that I love. I didn't mean to bring it up to be, you know, a jerk or anything, but, you know, it, it kind of made people in the community question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm I'm just here in this seat because people believed in me, and I have to ask hard questions. Mm -hmm. You know, because I go to 7-Eleven, I see teachers. You know, I see Mr. Sunderland all the time, and I just want to be able to go back to my district and give them answers. You know, I'm I'm not here just to, you know, dilly dally. I I want to be able to look teachers and parents and students. I want to be able to look them in the eye and give them an answer. Otherwise, I don't think I deserve to be here, so thank you. Okay, so 
So we haven't voted on that one yet, have we? <laughs> So we do, do we get a did we get a motion? I think I think we I think we already did. I'll, no, we no I'll make a motion okay. to approve this change. Okay, I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Five. Aye. Oh, she's opposing. Okay, five. Four, zero. No, four. Four zero one four, one. Four, one. Four, one two. Four one okay. I don't know how to read this. Four one two. Okay. Four one two. Okay. Um, the next one is report and discussion items. We don't have to be voting again. <laughs> so this one's from the nine point one Soquel Creek Water District report. Hi, good evening. Thank you, um, President Osmondson, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, and the Board of Trustees. My name is Melanie Mouse-Schumacher. I'm the Special Projects Communications Manager at Sohill Creek Water District. We have asked to be uh, on the agenda tonight to give a quick presentation on the water issues in the Mid-County area, which I think Trustee Home represents. Uh, Sohill Creek Water District, oh, let me see. So Hill Creek Water District is the water provider uh, from 41st Avenue down to La Selva Beach. So we provide about 3,000 acre feet per year to customers in Capitola, Soquel, Aptos, Rio Del Mar, La Selva Beach area. 100% of our water is groundwater. We do groundwater resources. We provide customer service. We do a lot of outreach and conservation. We do provide water to over 18,000 jobs, 22 parks, and 18 schools. Some of your schools are part of our community. Um, one of the things that we're very, very proud of is the education and outreach that we do to schools. Unfortunately, tonight, Vaidehi Campbell, who is our communications specialist, and she's headed our youth outreach and education program for over 10 years, is with her family um, at Big Sur. So she apologizes, uh, apologizes for not being here. This is one that she really wanted to be at. So. I hope to represent all that she does tonight, which is a lot. Um, just in these next two slides here, I did want to show that we do offer school assembly shows, which many of the schools in your school district do take us up on. They are free. Um, and we also provide grade level material, both in English and Spanish. And she does do a very good job at um, classroom presentations from preschool all the way through high school. Um, that's Vaidehi on the left. She also helps and coordinates and participates with Project WET um, with other youth educators in Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Um, the, the list of schools there are the ones that we do offer our outreach to specifically for the Pajaro Valley School District. We also um, do education for the SoCal Union School District as well as the Santa Cruz City Schools. And we're also going to be doing some outreach to the Live Oak School District. So it is a very high priority for us. Vaidehi has been doing it for so long that the children that she started with are now voting. And so that kind of um, education has grown with them in terms of what's important for water, in terms of water policy and water conservation. It was really interesting to see tonight the video, the video that you did. We also partner um, with Monterey County and Santa Cruz County um, on doing the Save Water video contest. And this year there were quite a few winners. Um, through that program from Aptos High. You have a, uh, the, the video and graphic design department there uh, really does support that. So if you're interested in watching any more videos, we do have those on the watersavingtips.org website. Mm. Watersavingtips.org. And this is a, an educational trailer. So we do do a lot of outreach. Um, we do and host a lot of meetings. But one of the missions of our board is to get out to the people. Um, so we do like to go and you know ask to be on different uh, board meetings. We take our trailer to events. We are just trying to spread water awareness. Mm. What I want to focus on tonight, just in case you aren't aware of the water situation that is affecting many of your schools up in our uh, mid-county area, is the water situation. So 
Um, the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Agency is served by a basin called the Mid-County Groundwater Agency. Um, and that basin is in critical overdrafted um, designation. Um, what does that mean? Uh, very similar probably to this area as well because um, seawater intrusion is occurring from the Pleasure Point area all the way down to the Monterey Carmel area mm -hmm. along the Monterey Bay Coast. But that's because we have depressed groundwater levels, meaning that there isn't enough fresh water to keep the water table high enough that seawater intrusion is um, coming in. And unfortunately, what that means when that seawater intrusion come in, comes in is that it's contaminating our groundwater resources underneath. Um, for our area, groundwater is the only source of supply, so it's a misnomer that we're called Soquel Creek because we don't get any water from the creek. Um, it was a name a long time ago we were going to develop, I guess the agency was going to develop a project along Soquel Creek. That project didn't go anywhere and then from, as history has been told, it then just became a groundwater management agency. So it's kind of deceiving but all of our water is from groundwater. As I mentioned, um, the basin is designated as critically overdrafted, so we are one of 21 basins in California that have this scarlet letter of being critically overdrafted. So what that means for your school district is that all of your schools are in two of the 21 basins that are critically overdrafted. Um, and what that means for our region is that the state has mandated that the ba groundwater basins need to be brought back into sustainability by 2040. That's the hammer that has been imposed. Um, and so all of the pink basins on that left-hand map um, are working diligently to become sustainable. The picture on the right is just, you know, groundwater is very hard to understand. It's not like a creek that goes dry. Um, and seawater intrusion and what that does is, is real. Uh, that is a customer and a farmer um, on the right. He has a private well and his well got salty. So he was unable to farm that. That is uh, just one of the, the customers in our area, in the Pajaro Valley area, that is already happening quite a bit. In 2017 and 2018, we did some very um, exciting and scientific data collection where we flew um, that basket on the left-hand side, which is uh, an electromagnetic uh, device, all along the coastline. You can see those flight lines um, to detect exactly where was that freshwater seawater interface. We knew. Um, from water quality sampling that we had active seawater intrusion on land. In the Pleasure Point Live Oak area, we were also detecting it in the Aptos La Selva Beach area. What we didn't know was how close that wedge was along the entire coastline. Um, when, we, when we say we detect seawater intrusion, the, the level that is considered still safe to drink for um, uh, water is 250 parts per million of chloride. Anything above that, it exceeds uh, the secondary MCL or the maximum contaminant level. In the Aptos and the La Selva Beach monitoring wells, we were reaching levels of 18,000 parts per million, and that's about half of seawater. So that is very brackish. We are trying to detect where it was on the entire coastline. So we did this flyover. It was peer reviewed by the USGS and Stanford University. And the results did show that we have seawater basically knocking at the door for the entire service area. Those purple um, triangles above on land are where all of our production wells are. And those are the wells that we want to keep safe. Those are the wells we want to keep with uh, fresh drinking water to serve. The red dots on the land show those are the monitoring wells that I was just talking about. And the red and yellow um, is the freshwater seawater interface that we want to keep at bay. Again, as I mentioned, this is not just happening in our area. It's happening all the way down to Salinas and Marina. In fact, it, it's all the way seven miles inland. So in our service area, uh, we developed the community water plan. It is a combination of maximizing conservation, 
doing adaptive groundwater management, meaning we're trying to pump wells more inland than coastal, and we're developing new supplies. Some of the three uh, water supply options that we're really focusing on right now is advanced water purification or a pure water SoCal project. We're also looking at getting water transfers from the city of Santa Cruz when they have excess river water. And we're also looking at developing stormwater capture projects um, in areas that the geology is conducive. So we are looking at possibly doing that at the golf course, the Seascape Golf Course. The projects all have various uh, yields to them. We do have a supply need of about 1,500 acre feet per year, so we do feel that the projects will be a multitude, a combination. Um, but our primary project that we're focusing on right now and a couple slides that I want to share with you is the Pure Water SoCal project. So the Pure Water SoCal project is very similar. If you've ever heard of the Pure Water Monterey project down in Monterey, there's also the Pure Water San Diego. It's taking and recycling uh, treated wastewater, secondary effluent, um, that is currently being discharged out to the Monterey Bay. And we'd be taking about 25% of that water and doing uh, water treatment to it. First, we'd take it to tertiary levels. Tertiary levels is what uh, creates kind of purple pipe water. That's non-potable irrigation water. That's what they do a lot here in the Pajaro Valley for irrigation and crops. If many schools probably go in and tour that down in Watsonville. We would be taking that water, doing it to tertiary levels, and then through advanced water purification. So that would go through reverse osmosis, hit it with some UV light, uh, advanced oxidation, and it creates this water. This is advanced water uh, that's been treated from Orange County. They've been doing this since the 1970s to fight off seawater intrusion and, and create a local water supply. And they've created over 200 billion gallons since they've been online. Mm. For us, Soquel Creek Water District is the lead agency, but we're also partnering and working with others, such as the city of Capitola, the county, the city of Santa Cruz, and the RTC, along with our project being identified in the Mid-County Groundwater uh, Area's Groundwater Sustainability Plan. Our project does span um, nine miles of pipeline. Uh, we'd be collecting and taking water from the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Plant over by Neri Lagoon, uh, treating that water to tertiary level. That water then would be used uh, to irrigate a nearby park as well as create a construction fill station. Then it would go four and a half miles over to a property on Chanticleer Avenue, right near West Marine and Staples. That's the location that we're proposing to do the advanced water purification. And then that water would go out to three strategically placed uh, seawater intrusion prevention wells. One would be near Twin Lakes Church, one at Willowbrook Avenue, and another one at Monterey. So in the vicinity kind of of where your Mar Vista school is. These are just some renderings of what the facility would look like. This is the tertiary facility that would be co-located at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility. And this is a conceptual artistic rendering of a the water purification facility that would be located on Shanna Clear. Uh, what's interesting to note in this image as well is that uh, the Regional Transportation Commission is proposing a bike pedestrian bridge overcrossing. So there's a lot of nexuses related to water um, and sustainable transportation with biking and, and walking. Ms. Mel, uh, mm -hmm. so ten, um, 10 minutes. On. I'm, I'm on the last yeah, slide, thank you. I'm so sorry. I will skip to the last part. Um, just in conclusion, sorry, thank you. Um, the project does cost about $90 million and we are actively seeking um, grants and low interest loans. That's why we're going out to so many people in the community. I would like to request that maybe on a future agenda, you would agendize to take action to support this effort. A sustainable water supply is very important to our community and to our schools. Uh, just to list just a few of the, our supporters, we have a list that I can provide to Superintendent Rodriguez, uh, Jimmy Panetta, Camille Harris, Diane Feinstein, Bill Monning, Mark Stone, um, all of the municipal agencies in our area, uh, many local officials, environmental groups. Um, we would like to have um, um, add to our list the various school districts that yeah. we serve. Mm -hmm. 
And just in conclusion, our goal is to have the project online and providing water to replenish the groundwater basin in 2022 to meet the state's mandate by 2040. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? Yeah, there was a question here. Go ahead, Jim. Um, just when, when I know that there sometimes tends to be a visceral or a reaction to like, oh, reclaimed wastewater. But I know when I've been, I, I'd like to check my understanding. Um, but the processes that are involved are essentially an accelerated version of what happens in nature anyway. Is that accurate? Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, this process is actually creates water that's cleaner than the treated surface water or groundwater that is served in California. Anybody else? So Kim is in, in that area too. Kim oh. and Jennifer, both of you. Oh, thank you guys. Not, not just Jennifer, yeah. Kim. I represent <laughs> Mar Vista. Oh, great. Okay. And Valencia. Oh, thank you. And Mount Tuss Jr. So a few years back, we had replaced all of the toilets in that area um, with low flow. And then the next year, you told us that, that we had to replace them again with like super low flow. And it ended up costing our district like almost $400,000 to again go out and replace all the toilets that we just replaced. So Was that because of some construction? You had to meet a, a green business goal? I'm not part of the conservation. That's department. okay. I just was frustrated with your agency because of the extra money that it cost our district, which I understand why. I mean, I, I my family's in farming and I manage my ranch and we have so all the wells in the Salinas Valley have been taken offline, as you know, um, near the ocean. And so my well is still in operation, but it, it, it is a little bit brackish, so I have to mix it with a different right. well. Right. Yeah. So, um, so, and I'm on um, the coalition over there, so I get all the minutes and oh, I, nice. I, yeah, I understand this very well. Um, so it looks like the, the, are they recharging wells that you're setting up? Yes. Okay, so they seem really close together considering it's such a large, um, so can you just tell me why they're so close together? Sure, yeah. and I'm so sorry that I didn't acknowledge that you no, were, that's thank okay. you guys for your service, all of you. Um, they are strategically placed, that is where most of our active and most productive wells are in that area. And so by um, creating seawater intrusion prevention and recharge wells there, we're able to pump those wells behind them a little bit more and then rest other wells. So we would be able to kind of what they call do passive recharge in other areas to maximize um, the, the benefits of using as little of injection wells as possible. Um, in, in Southern California, what they typically do is they'll have injection wells and they'll put like 20 or 40 together because they don't manage the wells behind them. So the people behind pump what they pump for us, what we're able to do is pump less in, say, Aptos and La Selva Beach area, pump more in those wells behind those seawater intrusion wells, and then serve it through our network of pipes. So is the hope that, um, that we can stop the? Yes. OK, the intrusion? Yeah, the ho it's not just the hope, it's, it's, and it's not just a goal, it's a mandate that we have to raise protective water levels such that we're not doing any more harm in the future to the groundwater basin. As a whole, Soquel Creek Water District is just one of four different other municipal water providers as well as over a thousand private wells. So collectively that region, we wanna stop that. Our project not only helps our wells, but it also helps other wells. And that's why in that area, the Mid-County Groundwater Agency has identified this project as a way to meet, meet that sustainability mandate. And in super rainy years, like the last two that we've had, does that help to recharge any of the water tables? R uh, rainfall does help, definitely. Uh, unfortunately, what is happening then with climate change, uh, the more intense rain and it's less frequent, we get less recharge. And the recharge into the groundwater basin going into the deep layers of our aquifer can take many, many years. So when there is excess rainfall, we, we do want to try to capture it through the stormwater projects. Uh, also, if the city of Santa Cruz is able to transfer water to us in those wet years, that means that we don't have to pump as much. Unfortunately, um, with the, the 
with drought and with um, sometimes excess rain, there's more requirements on surface water in terms of fish flows and others, so it's not as reliable. Yeah. Um, one thing I will say for the schools, the grounds themselves, like we've tried to do a lot of conservation, but the truth is is that if we don't irrigate our fields, kids get injured because the ground gets too hard and when they fall down, they break bones. So we have to keep, so just if you could take that back, we need to be able to irrigate our fields yeah, so, so that our kids don't get injured. I'm going to take that back as well as your comment about the retrofits. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just to remind also a five-minute discussion. I have a quick question, and it, it, this might actually be probably more directed to our superintendent, because um, this is here as a report and discussion item, but it's sounding to me like uh, this is coming back on a future agenda as a, a potential ask in the partnership that was mentioned, that other elective bodies have partnered with Soquel Water Creek, is that correct? So this was a request of SoCal Creek Water yes. um, to do this presentation. So the the request that she made was the first time that I've heard the request. Mm. Yes. So um, they asked to do this presentation. I did not ask them to do this presentation. I d yes, SoCal Creek Water District did ask. That request is just if you guys would like to agendize for a future, we are asking other agencies. And it's not necessarily to partner with us. When we apply for grants, um, they do ask for uh, as their regional support. And so we do submit when we apply for grants those that do support us. Okay, so I, I guess just if it does go that way in the future and it's brought back as an action item for us to partner or, or, or show support or whatever terminology you're wanting to put, I'd like to just have it really outlined what that entails for, the, uh, for our district, what it looks like. And you said you had a list of other agencies throughout the county that um, you've partnered with, including it sounds like even across Monterey County. Um, and you, if you could provide, have someone in your staff provide that to us to have, um, where is Cabrillo College with partnering with you and the Santa Cruz County Office of Ed? We have not asked anybody yet. You guys, uh, Vaidehi does a lot of efforts with the school district, and so she reached out to you and she reached out to SoCal Union Elementary School District. Um, we will be reaching out to the other school districts as well. And what the ask is is just a letter of support that says we support a sustainable water supply or the community water plan or SoCal Creek Water District's efforts in um, creating a, a reliable water supply. That's pretty much the ask. We're not asking for money. Um, we're just asking for local community support, and I can definitely provide you the list as well as the, it's a f just like a little form where there's a checkbox if you s so are so inclined to support us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So so 9.2 is PVUSD Instructional Technology Insights for the Bright Bite Survey. And that report is going to be presented uh, by Dan Weiser. There you go. Here Hi. I am. Hi. Good evening, President Osmondson, <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez, members of the board. Uh, tonight we're here to present some of the results of our annual Bright Bite Survey. With me, I have Nicole Calise for Bright Bites. And I also have Courtney Rudd, one of our district technology coaches. Um, this survey, this is the fourth year that we've completed the survey. Uh, and the data that we get back helps us to kind of, uh, you know, understand exactly where um, some of our efforts are impacting instruction, um, engage instructional technology initiatives. It also uh, gives us info about access to devices, network, internet connectivity access, um, and then technical support and professional development. Uh, so Nicole's going to go through some of the data, and then we'll answer questions. All right. Here's your clicker. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. So as Dan mentioned, um, I've had the pleasure of working with Courtney and your schools, and Dan, of course, um, over the past four years. You can pull down your mic. Yes. So not you There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we communicate via WebEx most of the time, so. Um, and the data on our side is all research-based. It's a survey that's administered once a year or twice a year, depending on the um, 
goals of your district when it comes to collection. I really intended to answer how is technology being used at the classroom level and how can we better support our students and teachers when it comes to using technology to best prepare them for the 21st century world of work and school. And so, uh, I'm missing one icon there. Uh, for your participation rates this year, again, this was your fourth collection period. This year, the district chose to collect in the spring, so unlike its previous years that collect in the fall, you had about 8,500 students that participated in the questionnaire. It takes about 15 minutes in grades three through 12. Um, almost 800 teachers and administrators and about 1,500 parents that participated. Uh, a web-based questionnaire is sent out and that's how the collection responses are elicited. Okay, and this is where I come in. So once the data is collected, um, it is visualized in a dashboard. And one thing that's neat about the dashboard is that you can view the data at a very high level or go very granular and view it at individual data points. There's over 200 data points that are amassed that may speak to different uh, facets of uh, technology teams. So for example, Dan's team works more on the IT side and Courtney's team works more on the instructional ed tech side. And so there'll be different avenues that each team can look at. What we see here is at the high level in which the data is organized. So everything within the dashboard is color coded according to the K-score legend. Um, in layman's terms, what we see as blue and pink are below average. Orange indicates proficiency or average. And advanced or exemplary are blue and green. Um, those are our ideal colors. A district that has uh, achieved blue and green is one that's fully one-to-one. -one. Teachers and students are actively and regularly using technology with their instruction. Um, there's a supportive environment when it comes to both te developing teacher skills and um, the culture around use encouraging the use of technology there. And so I want to point out the, the differences here. So what you see in the top row is the overall dials um, in which the data is organized. So classroom access, skills, and environment um, from May 2019, so this year's data, and then from your previous academic year in October of 2017. And what's really exciting for this year um, is that you see color changes in access in classroom. Um, I really want to call out the classroom domain shift. So we see it shifting from emerging to proficient, which is a huge success. Um, I do work with districts and county offices across the state of California along the West Coast. And um, this is a huge celebration, except especially for a district of your size. So to gain more insight into what that means, um, what, here's a different way to view your data. So you can view it um, at the color view or the high level view. It also allows you to compare your data to the California aggregate. So what, how are other districts in the state performing? Currently we are partnered with 159 districts across the state of California, um, as well as the international aggregate there. And excitingly we see that Pajaro Valley, PVUSD is um, above the state aggregate in three of the four categories. You also will notice that the inner two domains, so access and skills, um, tend to be higher performing overall in both your district's data, the state, and then the international aggregate. Um, that's a very common trend we're seeing. Whereas the outer two, the classroom and environment domains, is where that change tends to occur at a much slower rate when it comes to shifting in the positive direction as well as tend to be at a lower proficiency level. Um, I do want to call out though, as you can see in its previous three years, that Pajo Valley was pink or emerging in the classroom. So this is where you're getting a better sense of how often our teachers teaching uh, or using technology with the four C's. Um, and then this area, we do see that shift to proficient, which again, I want to call out there. Okay. And so kind of zooming in on the classroom, um, and we tend to see growth in the classroom domain uh, usually about three years into an implementation of a one-to-one. -one. And so this is pretty in line of what I typically see with districts that I work in. And so zooming in within the classroom domain itself, um, there are specific standards, what we call success indicators on the bright bite side that helps you understand, okay, within the classroom, where exactly are we seeing growth? And so for this e academic year, I wanted to highlight growth in student use of the four Cs, uh, teacher digital citizenship, and student digital citizenship. So the following slides will show specific areas within those standards that exemplified this growth. 
Just kind of want to uh, review what the four C's are for those folks who may need a refresher. Um, everything within the questionnaire asks around teachers' activities within their instruction that use the four C's in conjunction with technology. So I want to be very explicit there. Um, interestingly, I did see the four C's on the art wall over there. Um, but just want to be specific then for this questionnaire, it's only with technology. Um, and so when it comes to those four C's, what exactly are they? So how are students and teachers collaborating using their devices? Um, Courtney, Dan, and I collaborate off or online all the time. I work remotely at Las Vegas, and so that's how we communicate and work together. Um, how are students using their devices to be creative? So maybe as we saw with Dr. Rodriguez's presentations to synthesize the materials they're learning and then create videos and things like that. How are they communicating in different ways? So perhaps using them to communicate with outside audiences. And last but not least, most importantly, or some, let's say, um, how are they using them to develop critical thinking skills? And so we'll, we'll delve a little bit more into that. So this is pertinent to the creativity component of the four C's. I almost wanted to call this out and just to be explicit on what you're seeing here. So. The data or the platform allows you to compare your data from previous years to help you identify areas of growth as well as perhaps areas to improve. Um, what we're seeing here, the solid bars represent feedback from your students uh, related to the top skill. So how easy is it for them, their perception, to record and edit digital content um, compared to last year? What is always exciting for me to see from the data side is growth in the columns on the left, as we see here. So increases there of kids that are saying it's very easy and easy for them to do this, as well as decreases on the right side. So kids who thought it was impossible last year and have shifted somewhere to the left side there. And then why is this important? Um, you always will see a research citation below each data point indicating why we've included this within our framework and then how it will ultimately be valuable to students' learning. So we can see here, it's a little bit small, but children who are engaged with interactive technology can learn new skills even though they are unaware of this learning because they are so involved. We can see that from the video before. And this is a, a data point specifically from the classroom domain. And so um, it gives feedback around how often kids are asked to take digital photos or videos within their classroom. Again, a huge uh, celebration as well in that you're seeing growth on the left side. And so this is from the student perspective. So how often are my teachers asking me to do this particular skill with my de um, technology device? So we're seeing at least weekly and we uh, monthly increasing. I always want to call this out when you see the amount of kids that were never asked to do this last year and the amount it's decreased to this year. Here's a similar example as well related to those previous data points. So again, we're in the, in the nitty gritty right here, the, the deepest levels of the data points and um, how often students are asked to develop or present multimedia presentations. This could be any type of media here. As you can see, you're seeing growth on the left side and then decreases on the right. Here's another example of a four C's that we've al also seen growth within PVUSD. And so this one is how often students are asked to choose digital tools to help complete their work and communicate findings. And so we're seeing that more than half of your students um, in grades three through 12 are saying they're asked to do this from their teachers at least monthly. Um, in a related vein, um, and, and we'll see some other related data points after this, but just at a high level, how often are students asked to use the internet to receive information? So kind of a very basic 21st century skill. Um, we're seeing a huge drop in never, as well as a huge surge in weekly, which is exciting. Um, but in conjunction with this, um, it's important to recognize that due to the wealth of information that's available online, there's a lot that's credible and also a lot that's not credible. So how often our kids in conjunction with being asked to use internet to receive information are taught to evaluate the credibility of sources. I myself um, have to double check. I'm a huge, this is offside, sorry, killer whales fan and there was a really interesting story how this uh, Japanese whaling ship was, uh, the, s the sailors fell off into the ocean and got eaten by the whales, like yes. But it was a fake article, right? And I'm an adult, right? And I have a master's degree and I still wasn't able to do that. So imagine our students who don't have that life experience to teach them that. So it's important to keep those in conjunction. 
It's exciting to see that over half or almost half are, are taught this at least monthly. Likewise, so uh, for students' personal safety, um, how are they taught to check that websites are safe? Um, if they're being asked to go online for instruction, it's important to make sure they're safe there as well. Um, so uh, exciting to again celebrate these areas of growth within the classroom domain. Um, it is important though to recognize that there are opportunities within the district um, as we chatted with Courtney and Dan to continue professional learning opportunities to support teachers. So we saw in the previous data points there, uh, how can we best support or ask these questions on how can we best support our teachers with their skills so then when it comes to applying these types of activity in the classroom, they can feel well supported. Uh, we do see that the t top three interests for next year as reported by teachers this year are multimedia skills, classroom management with technology, and then online tools for critical thinking. Okay, so for next steps, again, kind of just looking at the data where we're headed for next year, um, the team has agreed to increase frequency of digital instruction by embedding it into the curriculum. So instead of having it as a side uh, subject, kind of interweaving the two. Um, increase the quantities of four C's uh, targeted ed tech professional development opportunities for teachers. And the last one um, kind of goes aligned with increase the quality as well in addition to quantity of instructional ed tech support provided to teachers uh, to impact their online skills, build those up, use of the four C's in the classroom and their digital citizenship skills. Any questions? Key comments or questions? Anyone? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So in the past, this is dating myself a little bit, yeah. so when I first came to the district with my kids, there was like only one working computer and it was in the office to take enrollment. And, um, and so the, we rolled up our sleeves and got computer labs on the campus. So when that happened, we were excited, but again, it was really rough because a lot of the teachers were in their some of them were in their 70s and didn't really understand how to use technology. So the parents ended up hiring somebody who was a t district teacher to come in and help them build their skills and make sure that every single classroom was rotating into that computer lab at least one hour a week, which just seems crazy, right? <laughs> um, so then we moved to smart boards as a teaching tool, what are we at now? Like if a teacher wants to present a, a lesson to the whole class at the same time, like what are, what are they using? So specifically the tools that they're using? Yeah, as far as like so I don't think smart boards are a thing right. anymore, right? So we've, we've implemented, mo mostly they're LCD displays. Okay. So you know, the smart boards, the projectors and the fans and the support it took um, and the cost uh, it was, is, and continues to be um, not really worth it in terms of the impact that it has. So uh, bond funds were used about two, three years ago to outfit every classroom with a set group of teacher tools, which included a display, document camera, and then there's the microphones that they wear with the, uh, the audio system. So as far as what they're displaying, though, um, that's constantly changing, too, in terms of you know, instructional tools that they're using and then internet content, all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's been a great effort to make sure that there is consistent access to teacher technology to display content. In the like equity in every school, because right. a lot of the schools were already outfitted, and then North exactly. Zone didn't have them. Yeah. Right. So well, everyone the has the Measure L bond funds allowed us to do to make sure that all classrooms had equal access to those types of tools. And is there anything newer and more exciting than that, or is that like the it technology? No, there is. There's there's definitely, and and Courtney can speak a little bit to the tech academies that we've been doing. So. Uh, the, the, the tech coaches have been working with schools and classrooms and specific teachers um, doing training in the class and working with their students and bringing kind of innovative technologies into those classrooms. Um, so you could talk a little bit about some of those projects. Um, and also I'm sure you probably already know that the sites are one-to-one -one Chromebooks so that there are Chromebooks available for every student in the classroom when they need them. Via the carts you mean? Via the carts and at most of the secondary sites they're also take-home. So the kids have them, they take them home, they bring them to class just like their backpack okay, or their great. notebook. Um, so with the Tech Academies, we also provide PD opportunities for teachers to sign up for like a video academy 
where they would get a lot of the same equipment that's provided through the Latino Film Festival organization. Um, we provide high quality training that's you know, pretty intensive. It's about 12 hours of training for the teachers to participate in that academy. We also have our coding academy, which provides different types of robots where students learn how to manipulate robots via coding on the Chromebooks. Um, we have a VR kit, which is virtual reality, where students can actually go on virtual field trips that are available um, globally. Um, we also provide a lot of other training around multimedia and different tools that they can use for students to create presentations or create documents or do some web website analysis and different tools such as that. That's part of our PD. Is the train, because I know that there is like a resistant group of teachers sometimes who weren't really interested in learning n new technology things. Is there a way where um, making sure that it's not just like the same group volunteering for these trainings over and over? Are, are we, I guess, what's the plan for like a rollout so that everybody has some we provide training for teachers that are from what we call the novice level all the way to the kind of high flyers. And part of what we find with our trainings is that if teachers don't show up or they don't sign up, it's the voice and choice um, philosophy, that they tend to be resistant. But what we also see is that when we are training the high flyers and we're providing this type of um, professional development and students are starting to produce stuff digitally, that other teachers within the site get excited or interested, and they kind of come out of the woodwork. Um, we also have done targeted PD before for novice teachers, and we provide like for beginner teachers to use Google Classroom, which is just a digital learning platform where they can send out digital work, students can submit it kind of via assignments and have communication going back and forth. Teachers get kind of excited about that because now they have the Chromebooks and they can do that kind of stuff. We should have sort of a training for parents <laughs> and board members, like available on the website or something because like my kids use the Google platform and I, um, I mean I use it a little bit but like, you know, I was, I grew up on the Microsoft and Mac so it's, it is different and weird and I don't know how to use it that well. <laughs> I don't know if I'm dating myself but I bet you there's a lot of parents out there that could use some training. I don't know if we could put some on the website, some type of? Uh, we do, we collaborate with the parent ed team and we've done sessions at um, like parent ed tech nights where we go out and show them some of those tools, especially how student or t parents can check in with their students work via school loop. And now that that's changed over to Synergy, there'll be like teacher access or parent access portals. And through that process, we often have um, parents that have zero skills technology wise and we'll pull them aside and help them get on the internet, get a Gmail account, etc. So we kind of do that in collaboration with the parent team but there's always room for more. So my, my, this is great. My last comment is just that um, some of the technology that's afforded us I think has caused a lot of problems in parent and kid relationships. For example, like school loop, sometimes if work doesn't get graded and entered in, it appears like there's zeros and then all of a sudden one day they have a B and the next day they have an F or, you know, in their grade. And parents get very angry about that. Um, and it, I, I think it, and sometimes it's because the teacher hasn't actually put in, in the graded work yet. And so I don't know if there, we could figure out a way to have a disclaimer because I think it does cause problems and it makes kids very, very anxious. So one of the things from the education equity audit, one of the steps that the, the teachers themselves put in was to um, ensure that there was weekly grade checks um, so that the teachers are inputting them um, weekly. Um, I think where sometimes the rub comes is you have some teachers that are overachievers, meaning they do, they're required to do it weekly or bi-weekly at this point, and some teachers do it daily, and so parents go on, and in some cases they see daily updates, and in other cases they see it at bi-weekly, and so there's quite the, the gamut. Um, so we there is all we always can put some type of a disclaimer. But what I would say of a parent of a parent who watched her son from afar for two years in high school, and that's how I tracked him, um, 
it has to be about us engaging the parents on how to engage with the digital tool, right? Because when I would see blanks, I had to then have a conversation with him of just saying, hey, what happened? Um, and so hopefully we can get to the point where we can help the parents know what questions to ask and what type of conversations to have. Um, and, um, and also use, in this case it was School Loop, but we'll have Synergy soon, um, communicate with the teacher. So um, the teachers knew exactly who I was because I would email them and say, hey, I don't see this. Um, and sometimes that's the little extra prodding that they need. So just encourage you. We are working on it though. Yep. So, so why were some of our why did we look really good there in all those some some of those categories even a, a little bit higher than some of the other districts i mean you showed that we actually were on the what happened there <laughs> so there has been uh, a lot of work and support and funding dedicated to the infrastructure the devices yeah. uh, coaches for teachers yeah. uh, the implementation of a variety of digital tools and initiatives through partnerships with a whole bunch of different organizations to get our schools, our classrooms, our students, great technology and great support for our teachers to make use of it in meaningful ways to enhance their instruction. And we're starting to have been seeing uh, trends that show that we're making great progress in those directions. So that, that's, that's what we want to see, so. Exactly, we do. <laughs> so I just want to say a note, because I know that I spoke to the board about it at the last one. Um, we did pass to the, to the last stage of, um, of the League of Innovative Schools, so I have my final 15 minute making sure that I am who I say I am um, because it's linked specifically the the honor is linked to the superintendent so if there was a new superintendent you'd have to reapply um, and we have that on Friday so they it's it's fairly um, cursory meaning it's just to make sure that um, I'm not who I don't say I am but um, we will be able to um, be part of and I know their group was also part of the digital promise um, conference that they had um, but we will be part of the League of Innovative Schools um, starting next year. So, um, and that's because of the good work um, that has been happening and the innovation that we are taking on and our teachers and staff are taking on. Wow, yep. very cool. Really, thank you to our community who supported Measure L so that we would yep. have the technology, um, what's it called? Not trust fund. The endowment as well. Endowment, that's so, what I was looking for. Yeah, I wanted to mention a lot of the technologies that that Courtney was talking about that are supported by those tech academies have all been purchased with that endowment fund, which was focused on innovation and a continuing innovation um, as technology has changed. So yeah, it's the Measure L funds um, that support the, the school sites, the infrastructure, and the buildings, and the, and the devices, and, and the classrooms. Yeah, equity. But then the endowment funds have yeah. been really, really critical too, so. Is the League of um, Innovative Schools, does that um, help us uh, apply for grants that could, yeah, bring more money, yeah? Exactly. So, one reason so I hope both why I'm on TV, but hopefully they don't see this before they talk to me on Friday. Um, so part part of it is um, that a lot of the endowments and the foundations look to that list. Um, we, as I had mentioned before, we're on the short list for um, for the Hewlett Packard grant, and so they rely heavily on outside organizations validating the work of the organizations that they're supporting. Um, so it will allow us, um, in Santa Ana specifically, because I helped to get the designation there, we got a Gates grant right after we were labeled a League of Innovative Schools. So we were labeled a Gates Promising District, and then we received funding from that. Um, and so we hope to um, see the same. Dan, do we have any e-schools? Is that still a thing? Uh, remember are you we talking used about EETT? E Is that no? The remember old, uh, the E matching monies, like we E rate. Oh, e rate. Oh, e yes, yeah, it's e definitely a thing, and all of our schools qualify for E rate. Um, e rate funding goes in. It, 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 the the rules for it change so that the funding is over a five-year period, and we we're, we're coming to the end of this five-year period. So all of the budgets for those schools will renew, but every one of our schools has l really cutting edge you know, some of the, the best possible network infrastructure, and that's because the district as a whole qualifies at the highest level for E-rate funding. No, and then also the bond funds have helped support the, the network infrastructure. But yeah, definitely, 
E-rate is definitely a thing and we will continue to apply for it. Oh, we, we've been getting it, I mean, I've been here for quite a long time. And for a we've long been getting time. a lot of E-rate funds, like year yeah. after year, a lot of E-rate funds. Well, and that's what's allowed us to maintain the infrastructure necessary to be able to do all this work, so. Thank you, good yeah. job. And thank you. thank you to really everybody for rolling out a, a really, de and the coach it's a developed too. program. It's very exciting. Yeah. 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 Can I just ask one more thing? Yes. Um, so we've come a long way. What's next? Like, what are you hope? What are you hoping? So for? we're seeing great progress in so many different areas lately. Um, and so the latest thing that we've been working on and talking about is collaborating with the Extended Learning Program on some of their like their Technologicas grant that they have, and incorporating oh, yeah, a lot of the technology projects and programs into the Extended Learning Program, and then collaborating as well with uh, the curriculum department, curriculum coaches to integrate more, a lot of this kind of enhanced technology into the curriculum content itself. Um, and then we've also been working on ways to get deeper into the classroom and be there with students and teachers so the training doesn't happen outside the classroom and we don't pull out teachers and have to get subs. Instead, the coaches are in the rooms with teachers helping make the projects happen with students. And then another part of that whole process that's really uh, helpful and exciting and we're seeing progress is bringing the technicians in. So every school site has dedicated technical staff and having them support the instructional content and the, not just the technology itself, but the staff and students that are making use of that technology. So. And, and, and hopefully on those four C's, you know, you can really think of all these incredible new ways, you know, to think about the four C's, you know, whether it's creativity, you know, critical thinking, all those kinds of things yeah, too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's one of those things that really engages students and helps to take them deeper into the content that they're studying, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you bright, bright person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, now we're gonna be hopefully almost done. <laughs> we're gonna do the consent agenda. I'd like to pull an item from the consent agenda. Oh no, <laughs> I thought we were gonna be finished, <laughs> okay. Um, so. 10.15. Okay, but I'm, I'm, I, I usually do the motion first and then you pull. So can I have a motion first? I'll make a motion um, okay. to approve the consent agenda deferring item 10.15. And staff would like to request to pull 10.21 as the vendor has not accepted the terms of the contract. Amending my motion to also um, pull, not, well, remove um, item 10.21. Okay, and then you're pulling which one? 10.15. Okay, so go for it. Okay. No, wait, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Do we need a second? Yes. yes. So yeah, I'll we need a second. Yeah. We need a motion, a second, and then we defer. That's mostly what we're supposed to do. <laughs> okay. Wait, so did we do the, the motion? Did we ask them to do the, did we do the motion and a second? And yeah. did you do a vote? Yeah. We haven't done a vote, so we're going to do a vote, and then we're going to do yours. Yeah. So, um, so we have a motion and a second. Can all in favor? Aye. 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 And then all those opposed and, and go ahead okay. with the So Chief Business Officer Jill, it looks like we just approved that new position, but then I l look at this consultation piece. What is the difference between the, the two? It just looks like they're doing the same job. Yeah, so um, we currently have uh, a management position uh, vacancy in our, our fiscal um, services uh, department uh, so and this also assists with the transition of uh, not only the uh, oversight executive oversight of escape uh, at the county level but also with our transition as a district um, with the vacancy and then the support uh, for our department so we currently have a couple components the position of the new job description that was approved this evening was more of uh, information systems so more of the programming software uh, financial system, financial software, uh, training, PD, et cetera. Uh, this uh, the consultant is assisting us, and it's actually an extension uh, of a previous agreement that we had 
um, but to renew it, to extend it for this current um, interim budgets that we're going through to support our department. Um, and then we will at a later point in time bring our management uh, job description that we're re-analyzing uh, right now and uh, we'll provide that to the board um, and that's also part of this transition as well. And we, we do also have some um, pending retirements at the end of the fiscal year. So it's also to assist with that transition as a whole. So just making sure that we have continuity and that we have um, uh, the, the support needed to make sure that we meet all uh, our requirements. Um, but this will be something that we'll also build to have internally as well. So this consultant will be making thirty to forty thousand dollars for this one year alone, for the end of the fiscal year. Yes. Wouldn't it, it be cheaper if we could, you know, hire a CPA or a part-time inside person to overlook or work with you? We are in the process, as I mentioned, um, redeveloping a, a job description. Mm -hmm. So we are in the process, but in the meantime, uh, it's important to have the support uh, as we have our upcoming budget. Um, reports and then also the escape transition with the county um, but to, to your answer to your question is yes and we are working in that process as we speak um, one of the other uh, items is that the position is um, as required or the agreement is as required so it's not every day Monday through Friday from mm -hmm. tomorrow for the end of the fiscal year it's on call and so we are also working, if approved this evening, on a schedule on the, the different milestones or portions of the fiscal calendar that we're gonna need the consultant. And when we don't need the consultant, we won't um, ask the consultant for assistance. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve item 10.15. Okay. Second. Second, Jamie. I'll second. <laughs> okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I oppose. Our upcoming meeting, we're gonna have a special board meeting, which is the superintendent's evaluation scheduled for Wednesday, August 10th at the, I think it's, it's not the district office boardroom, I think it's gonna be at human resources boardroom, I'm pretty sure. And our next regular board meeting will be on Wednesday, August 2nd at the district office Oh, on the 21st, which it didn't say it right. <laughs> Put odd and, I, and I thought, well, that doesn't look right. No. Yeah, it's going to be August 21st at the district boardroom. Yeah. August 21st is the next regular board meeting. 